Hey guys, I managed to catch a live stream of the latest episode of Game of Thrones, so I will be able to do a review of the first three. Whoop, lost post. Anyway, um, the first three episodes of Game of Thrones. Um, I I would say that if you want a straight up TV recap of the episodes, you should definitely go to Larry Williams' Otaku Assemble site because I've read the books, and so my opinion of certain things that have translated from the book to the show are gonna come up and I can't help that it's just kind of like part of the way I see the show now so I will try so I'm not gonna spoil anything because that's not fair to you I'm not gonna spoil anything but there will be comparisons between how things are handled in the show and how things are handled in the book so if you don't want to do that you don't want to hear that um Larry's videos they're great he definitely handles that with just the show. In the first episode we pretty much are getting everything brought back in together. We start off with Joffrey's name day where he has the hound fighting a group of men for his entertainment throwing them down um cabin so he can see the blood. Joffrey is pretty much a young Caligula in this in this show. He's power obsessed, he's crazed, he has no concern for his family or his friends, whichever ones they may be. He loses everyone like a pawn, and he feels no qualms about taking life at any time. Um, Dantos, for example, who comes in just drunk because he's having a fun day or whatever, Joffrey takes his drunkenness as an insult and then decides that he's gonna have him just drowned in, in alcohol. And Sansa, my, my sweet Sansa, um, she saves Dan Dan Dantos' life by kind of, you know, sugar coating, sugaring Joffrey up, saying, oh, you're so smart, you see him as a fool, that's who you should be. Um, and you see kind of what Joffrey has become. Sansa herself, she is pretty much a prisoner at King's Landing. She has no power, she has no control. All she can do is pretty much fight to stay alive by buttering up Joffrey. And this isn't, this isn't made any easier by when... Tyrion comes, being awesome as usual, and pretty much asks Sansa about, you know, the, her brother and everything, and all of a sudden everyone looks to her and the pressure's on her to be like, okay, I, I want to feel bad, I want to be sad, but I can't because I have to pretend I'm loyal to Joffrey. And just to briefly stop and talk about Sansa's character, her and her mother, Kat, I feel are two characters where their point of views in the books help make them who they are. They, especially Sansa, who has to, like, be one thing on the outside and think another thing on the inside, it's not that Sophie isn't a good actress, it's that they don't really give her an opportunity to really talk about her feelings and her emotions because she's always stuck with either the, the Lannisters or later on we get Shay. But it, that also, too, is kind of like, there's this apprehension she constantly has about being spied and being watched. And the only one she really manages to kind of open up even a little bit with is the Hound, and they really haven't developed that relationship with her and him that much, so except for that one part in the finale, so we don't really have that. So Sansa's character really doesn't get allowed to be as complex as she could be because of the way her point of view and the way her character is structured. She is playing, she has two faces right now, and we only really get to see the one face with hints of the inner one, but there's no situation that comes out to really give her a big piece of exposition like we used to get with, later on with other characters, some of them who don't even need that kind of exposition, but that's that. So. Tyrion comes and he is the new hand of the king and you know he's with he's arguing with Cersei about how to handle the situations and how to handle Joffrey. Cersei is Cersei is an interesting character and I have always enjoyed her character in the books even when she's crazy because she she is a lot she has a lot of complexity that I feel that the show does does well at times, but also downplays a lot of what's cruel about her, and I'll talk about that further on later. But then you get um, Cersei doing her own thing, and then you have Cersei's conflict with Littlefinger, where they argue about power, and she basically goes like, look, you think because you know things that you're powerful, but really, I can have you killed anytime I want. However, right after that, we get a scene with her and Joffrey, where Joffrey's basically being like, um... I don't give a shit about you, Mom. 
I don't care about your feelings, your opinions, your thoughts, whatever. You just tweet, tweet, tweet. And she slaps Joffrey, which, you know, we all love, but Joffrey's like, that's the last time you're going to do that again. And we really get to see that, just like Cersei said, power is power, Joffrey has all the power. And she's put him in a position to have that full control, and she doesn't know what to do with him. We also get to see Danny, and Danny, she's a fan favorite, but she's not going to get a lot of scenes this season, um, because her part in the book is very small this this um, this time around. But we see her and the rest of her Kalasar basically just trying to survive, and she has um, one of her Kalasar, one of her um, people go to try to find out land. But so far, nothing. It's just miles and miles of sand, and when the member of her Kalasar returns, his head is chopped off. That's in episode two, but since Danny's only had like two scenes, we're just gonna smush those together and put them there. And really, Danny, you see her struggling to try and be a leader and be strong, but like she says, how is she supposed to fight starvation? That's not the thing you can just attack. So you really have to see with her trying to be a leader, and she does it with a small group of people, and she's trying so hard that it's, it's, it's really sad and heartfelt, because you can tell she wants to do well, but she just doesn't know completely what she's doing yet. In the north, we have Rob, and Rob is leading his, his, his army in the north, and he's trying to win the war. Um, sorry, fly. And he's trying to win this war against the Lannisters to make the north an independent nation from the rest of um, Westeros. And he does this by keeping Jamie Lannister on him at all times, making sure he isn't um, being able to be snuffed off or gambled or gambled away by anyone who's looking for a quick cash from Lannister money. And we also get to see how big the direwolves have gotten because they're supposed to be huge, like prehistoric animals. So that comes in, and that's a great scene just because you get to see kind of the might of the Starks, even though CGI is kind of like iffy, so-so, it's still a, a good scene to tell you about the power of that raw wheels. Now, this scene I'm going to kind of talk about Cat. One of the things that, like, I am not Cat's biggest fan. I, I, I enjoy her character, but I don't love her character for other people. That being said, she is severely downplayed in the show in terms of how smart and how savvy she actually is. For example, not to just go on, to, to, for example, go back to season one. When Ned, ha you know, they always play Kat as the doting mother, doting wife, that she's all 100% family, that's all she cares about. They completely downplay how smart she is politically, because in season one, when, in the books, when Ned is offered to become Hand of the King, you know, it's Ned who's like, maybe I should do this, I have to help save my friend, and everything like that. It's it's Cat who tells him that in the book. In the in the show, she's all like, "You have to stay here. You have to be with your family. This is where you belong." But in the book, she's like, "Look, this." Especially after she gets the message from um, her sister, she's like, "You have to see what the Lannisters are doing. This is a threat to the entire kingdom. Rob's um, Robert's your friend. You can't just leave him out there." So you really get to see that Cat isn't just she is about her family, but she also has common sense which sometimes gets downplayed in the show. For example, in, in the first episode, when the whole argument comes between her and about Sansa and Arya, in the books, she understands that. She understands that Arya and Sansa are not going to be the ends all of the war. That they're not, that they're, while they're part of her goal, they're not the ultimate thing. And she is the one who offers to go talk to Rantley to try and bridge an alliance between the two of them. That's her idea. It's not Rob. And one of the things that really gets played down is because of the age ups of the characters. Because in the books, Rob and stuff are, are they're young kids. They're about 14, 16 years old. And so you see them as boy kings. But in the show, they're just trying to make it straight up like he's great, he's smart, he's a warrior king. And that kind of you know, silly boy aspect of his character of like he thinks He's trying to be a leader, but he doesn't know completely what he's doing. That gets put down, and Kat 
no longer has a role because part of what she is in that storyline is being the one to help him and tell him how to be a good leader and help him learn how to do things and kind of steer him in the right way even when he doesn't listen. But because of the change they make, they really make her just seem like she's only a one-known mother who only cares about her kids, only cares about Winterfell, and that's not really all that she is. And that's kind of upsetting, especially when you consider that fucking Roz gets like a five-minute scene. I mean, I think altogether of the first two episodes, she has had more screen time than Sansa and Caitlyn really had up until maybe this episode with a little bit more Sansa. But Roz's character is just a waste of time. I don't know why she's brought in. I mean, she's supposed to be a, a grouping of all the prostitute horror women for the most part with exception of Shay because she's a major character and they can't really get rid of her and Roz is just not that interesting all she really is there to do is be part of exposition and be part of you know what's little finger is he how bad is he we already knew he was a bad guy we already knew he was a pimp we already knew he was a crook we already knew that he did stuff to um to get money I mean there's a whole scene with him talking with it what, um, the spider about how he gave dead corpses to this guy so he could have sex with them. We know what Littlefinger is willing to do to make money. Do you have to really do a five minute monologue with explaining this kind of like backstory? When there are plenty of characters who actually need that kind of monologue exposition to, to help develop them. But you develop a character who doesn't even exist in the book and really serves no purpose in the long run. I mean, for her to be the voice of the people which is what some people think of her to be, makes no sense because later on in the series you get people whose entire point is to fill those roles with Arya and Brienne and other characters like that. She is pointless to me, and I don't understand why she's still there. Then we also get the whole idea Stannis comes in, and Stannis is Robert Baratheon's younger brother. Um, he's a seasoned commander, he's a general, and he's been working with Melisandre. I don't know how to say her name, so I'm just going to call her Mel. She's been working with Mel to pray to God Ralph, Rolar, Raptor. It's pretty to God Raptor to um I'm really bad with names and pronunciations and I haven't heard it this episode so I forgot what it's even called. She working with them to try and become king because he doesn't have the support that Ren that Renly does because Stannis is kind of a asshole. And so they have the whole relationship with Mel and the Shadow Gods and the fire and that's going on. And the kind of issues I have with that is that Sansa's character is very uptight and asexual, and while he does have sex with Mel, at least it's implied in the books that he has sex with Mel, it's not about getting sons. Because one, that doesn't make sense, because Stan is supposed to be like super moral to an annoying degree, and the only reason why he's having these children will be explained later, but he has a child, he has an heir, and part of his motivation is because they're denying him and his daughter, who he has, the right to their throne. That's part of his motivation. And he does care for his wife, even though she's kind of crazy. And she's actually one of the first converts to the new religion. So that doesn't really make that much sense to me. But I can see they wanted to make it like really blunt, like, they're having sex! Okay, thanks. We couldn't figure that out. But that's what's going on with that. Um, Mel is a really interesting character. Um, she's the evil sorceress. Morgan Le Fay character and I think that's really and I think that her character is really interesting and in seeing just how like she plays her own role and how she uses the characters and as we'll see later on. And a little bit of Arya in the second episode with her and Gendry. Um, Gendry as if you don't recall from before in the first season he's Rob Stark he's um he's um Robert's bastard and what's happening now is Joffrey is killing off the bastards because he had a whole conversation with his, with his mother about how many bastards did dad have when he was done having sex with you and so he started killing bastards. I'll get to something about this in a second but let me just go, go quickly through this. Um, so Gentry and Arya are traveling with the, going up to the Night's Watch and Arya is poison, posing as a boy so that she can go to Winterfell and be reunited with her family. Gentry's going to join the Night's Watch. Um, and in Winterfell, you have um, Bran, who is having these crazy mystic visions about him kind of being connected with a wolf. And he's also now the ruler of Winterfell. And he is doing his thing, 
trying to be a good leader and so on and so forth. But he's really just, he's also, he's, he's even more a kid. Really, it's the Mazer who's running the whole operation. And then we have Theon Greyjoy, who is not my favorite character at all. And he returns to the Iron Islands at the request of Rob. Really, it's Theon's idea, but he wants to go home. But it's really through Rob he's doing this as well. He's going to go to his father, Balon Greyjoy, to try to get the Iron Island army to join with Rob so that they can um, work together. That way, And what we'll, Rob will do is by them helping them, they will declare the Iron Islands their own nation separate from Westeros completely. Um, Balon Greyjoy just ain't having that. He They follow the Iron Price, which is like they... The words are, we do not sow, and as it gets explained in the third episode, they don't buy things. They take what is theirs. And so if they're going to be free and independent, they're going to pay for their independence with blood. They're going to fight for it. That's what they do. Theon doesn't really understand this. He's grown up in Westeros since he was about eight years old. He doesn't really get how the system works, and so his father's kind of like, oh my god, my kid's a pansy. Oh jeez. So that's really his mindset. And then you have... Asha, who's turned into Yara in this in this adaptation because too many A sounding names get confusing apparently. And Yara is Theon's sister and she's kind of a troll because she kind of like what Theon has a problem about putting his, his fingers and his dick in anything that he can find for some godforsaken reason. And so one of the things that he does is like when he's on the road with Yara, he doesn't rec recall her because when they were separated they were young so he doesn't know what she looks like. And so he starts pretty much feeling up and fingering his own sister but he doesn't but she doesn't say anything because she's kinda of just like troll lo 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 and so when he goes home and he's like, Who else is gonna leave the capital, huh? Huh? Sister comes in like, Yeah, me. I got this. Thanks for filling me up. So that's the on situation up to that point. Um, then you have Tyrion basically sifting through people he finds untrustworthy. He gets rid of the um, the leader of the City Watch because he betrayed Ned Stark and he's not reliable. So he's like, get the fuck out. And he puts his homeboy Bronn in the situation instead. And he's like, what's up, dude? Got this. And so Shay's with him and she's like, I want to go outside and be awesome. And he's like, girl, you're going to fuck up all my shit. Stay indoors. Um, the thing I want to get back to with Cersei before I go on to just talking about the third episode is that in the books, Cersei is the one who has the bastards killed. In the show, it's Joffrey. I don't like this change because I feel like they're trying to make Cersei more sympathetic. Without spoiling, I'm just going to say that Cersei is not sympathetic in a traditional way. She's not, she cares about her family, her life, her people, except Tyrion, that's it. What's sympathetic about her are her circumstances about her gender, which come out in later books. She is limited by being a woman and what she can do in Westeros. Besides the Iron Islands, Dorne, and Dorne, which we'll get to later, um, no women don't inherit directly. They go to the male heir and through the male kin. So basically she has been doing all this thing that she's been doing, like raising Joffrey to be leader, so that she can rule through him so she can have some power for herself. Part of what makes her sympathetic is realizing that all she wants is to be independent, but she cannot be independent because she's not allowed to be. She has to be someone's wife. She can't inherit Castle Rock. She can't be queen in her own right, even though um, Rob's dead. Everything she does is limited by the fact that she's a woman. And that is what makes her character compelling. Try to make her nice so that, oh, she didn't kill innocent babies. Stop. Please stop. Because that's not Cersei Lancer. Cersei Lancer don't give a fuck about nobody that's not her family, okay? She would kill any baby in the world if it meant that she could have Joffrey be, be king. So, I don't like that. Cut that out. Like, you don't need to make her sympathetic by being like, she's so soft-hearted and she loves babies. No, stop. Unnecessary. So, Episode 3, which I wrote down extensive notes. Oh, wait! Forgot. The Wall. Okay. John went beyond the wall in the north, hanging out with wildlings. Sam likes J um, Jilly, who is another character from Skins. Um, she's pregnant because the, the, um, the leader of the wildlings, he has sex with his daughters and marries them, makes them his wives, and when they have, when he, they have more daughters, he gets more wives, and if they have sons, he sacrifices them to, um, 
to White Walkers. And John just discovered this, and Sam was all like, we gotta take her on the situation. So that's what happened with John. His storyline I forget about sometimes because it's not involved with the main plot, really. So I'm just kind of like, all right, you got stuff. That's the problem with his and Danny's plot. It's just that they're so separate from the main crux that you kind of forget what, what the hell is going on. <coughs> so, in episode three, we open up with John getting told by Mormont that, like, look, we know he's an asshole, the leader of the Wildlands. We know he's an asshole. We know he's a bad guy. But he helps us out. And we don't really help them out that much. So we just let them kill babies because we don't really care. And John's just like, but but it's horrible. And Mormont's like, look, we know. We just can't. We just don't look at it. It's like, yeah, you kill babies, but we don't really know that. So they're talking about how, and he also brings up the fact that something took them. And Mormont said, like, whatever you saw, you're probably going to see it again. So the White Walkers were pretty much sure that they exist, and people just aren't being told about that. Why? Don't know. Probably because they don't believe it. Because in this world, they're like, it's a fairy tale, which means it's true. Um, Sam gives Jilly a spindle that used to belong to his um, mother, and has a whole speech about like how he loved his mom and all that kind of stuff. And then that storyline pretty much is over for that episode. Then... We get Bran, who basically, we get to see how, like, he is bonding with his, he, how he basically says that he's going to something else's body and eating and hunting and ever. And the maze basically tells him about, like, yeah, there used to be magic, we think there was magic, but we, it's myths now. And in, you know, this world, made up stories equals true facts. So, this will probably come back later on with Bran's story, and about him getting over his disability. Not in that sense, because that sounds very ableistic, but it's about him, his disability not hindering him from being part of the main story and being a champion for something else. It goes towards making him more independent, despite what's going on with him not being able to walk. Um, then we get to the Renly's camp, and we see Renly, his new wife Margaret, played by Natalie Dormier from the Tudors, hey, um, and Loras. And we get the introduction of Brienne, yay! The female knight knows Brienne the Beautiful, she, um, she's Brienne of Tarth, she is in love with Renly, and she is devoted to him, and she becomes one of his, um, Kingsguard, and Cat goes, sees the battle, and he, ba she basically goes to Renly like, look, you guys need to stop playing around because you guys are all summer children and I feel bad for you because the war is going on and you guys are just playing little games like you should be getting ready, getting ready to fight. And Renly's like, we're get, we're, we're, we got this. Like, we, we got it going on. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you Joffrey's head. It's going to be off the hook. I got you, girl. So that's his whole thing. And But really what's going on is because he's married to Marjorie, who is Loris' sister. And Loris and Renly are gay lovers. So... Loris is telling Renly, like, look, you have to sleep with my sister. And Renly's like, nope, can't do it. There's a scene where, like, Margaret comes and she strips her clothes off, nice titties, and Renly's drunk. She's just like, can't get up, cannot get up, cannot do it. And Margie's like, do you want me to, do you want me to bring my brother in here? Do you, like, want to, and then I can just, you know, no? Which, I love her. I love Natalie Dormier, even though I don't like Anne Boleyn. She play, she's just a great actress, and she really plays that role like, like, look, I want you to become king because I get to be queen, and that's awesome. So, get with it. Um, and so you get the dynamic between that relationship about Renly having to lie and hide his relationship with Loras to be with Margaret so that he can have an heir, solidify his throne, and prove that he's kind of like a man's man because people are whispering behind his back because Littlefinger already knew that he had a gay lover, so other people will know and it's stigmatized there as much as we can assume it's stigmatized here for men in power to be homosexual. So that's a problem going on. Um, so the Iron Islands, Balon Greyjoy, he has a plan to attack Winterfell because right now Rob and all his men are concerned with fighting the Lannisters. And Theon is like, um, dude, maybe we should not do that. Because if we side with them, we can just get our independence for free, and that's awesome. And Theon's just kind of like, and, and Balon's like, no, we do not sell. What of that don't you understand? We don't do fields, we don't do money, we take, and we take, and then we get the fuck out. 
And they and Balon and Theon had this whole argument because Balon gave up Theon when they lost the when the, the Iron Hands lost the war when they rebelled against Westeros. And Ned Stark took the sun and he gave him up. And so Balon is like angry at Theon for being this way. But Theon's like, Dad, you totally dumped me and left me and you gave me to these people. So why are you mad at me for me being this way when you didn't try to you didn't try to come to get me, you didn't try to save me, you just gave me up. And so there's that whole dynamic and then you have Yara coming in like, do you want our dad to be a bitch? Why are you being this way? And she's basically just like, and sh the whole conflict between them is that Theon doesn't, he's kind of, he's a misogynistic guy. I'll just say it. He's a misogynistic. He doesn't see a woman as being capable to rule. Where Yara's kind of like, stop bitching. All you do is cry and whine and complain. Shut the fuck up. Which I agree with personally because he just, no one loves me, I'm a lord. Shut up. Um... And so you have Theon's loyalty really being tested. And even though I don't like him, the acting was really good in this scene. He's like, you did this. You gave me up like you didn't want me. Why are you mad at me for coming back home? And so you have him destroying his loyalty to Rob and joining the Iron Islands in this, this fight against Westeros. Which, I'm looking forward to that because that's going to be fucking badass. Ooh, yeah. So then we get more of Shay. She's mad because she's indoors and she wants to go outside. I like Shay. I I I enjoy her character because she doesn't just be like, "Oh, you're so awesome, Tyrion. I love you." She's like, "Can, can I get to go outside, please? Like, why'd you bring me here if you were just gonna lock me in this tower all day? I ain't a princess," <laughs> which I can appreciate. Um. So then Shay gets sent over to be Sansa's um handmaiden and. Sansa, before the handmaid scene, was at dinner with um, Princess Marcella and Tommen, and Marcella and Tommen were so sweet. They're so nice. I don't know why they came from, I don't know how that happened, but they're so sweet. And they're like, when you get married to Joffrey, it's going to be great. And Sansa's like, I'm so excited to marry Joffrey. I love him. And you get that conflict. Then Shay comes in, and she's kind of just like, she's instantly rude to her. And I feel like this scene... It's gonna be like more proof of like, sounds as a bitch. No one, no, that's why no one likes her. Da, da, da. But it's like you don't get to understand it. Like she's paranoid about there being a new handmaiden because she doesn't know if she's a spy. That's really what that whole thing is about. And it doesn't come off that. I it comes off that way to me because I know what it's going on. But other people like she's just being a bitch. It's like no, she doesn't trust people because everyone here works for the Lannisters and they're against her. So she's just kind of like just brush my hair. I don't want to be alone, but I don't trust you. So that's Sansa's whole thing right there. This isn't really a serious review. I'm sorry if you thought I was going to be like more professional. I'm just kind of like, ah, stuff. Um, yeah, and they mention um, House Martell, which is my house. I was like, hey. That's my shit. Um, also, I was upset about Loras and Renly not having hot sex. Just saying. We need more penis in Game of Thrones. I'm tired of seeing every girl's titties, but I don't get no penis except Hodor and Theon. I don't want that. Um... The, um, what, what Tyrion does, which is awesome, is that he, he tells um, Mazer, the old Mazer who works in King's Landing, Littlefinger, and the Spider, that he plans on marrying the Princess Marcella to different people. He tells the Miser it's Dorne, he tells Littlefinger it's Robin, and he tells um, the Spider it's Greyjoy to see who's going to betray him, which is great because not only does it, does it show... T um, Tyrion savvy just politically about how he's like, um, I'm not gonna die. Fuck that. I'm gonna be smart about this. But then you also get the conflict with Cersei and and um and Tyrion about sending Marcella away. And this is what I mean about you don't need to make Cersei this kind of like bleeding heart person to really get her character. Like she loves her children. She doesn't want her daughter to be sent away. And that whole scene is like, I don't want him to be sent away like I was sent away. And I'm like, that's a good scene. That shows her character. That shows her emotions. You don't have to make her like, oh, I'm so sad about babies to really develop that. And so I like that scene because it really shows Cersei as a mother and how she does care about her children. She just doesn't care about anybody else. And that makes her character more complex. And also just every scene that she's had with Tyrion so far has showed more about her. Like the scene where she and Tyrion are talking about their mother. And about how she feels about that. That's when you see Cersei. Littlefinger, they're making him stupid. I do not approve of this changes. Like, 
Littlefinger is very smart. He is very savvy. He would not fall for Tyrion's bullshit. But in this show, I don't know why. They feel the need to just be like, hammer on. Littlefinger's bad. Littlefinger got tricks. Thanks, show. Wasn't aware. Um, but yeah, I, I part I feel like it's to just reaffirm character traits, but at the same time it's kind of like, most people who watched this season have watched the first season, probably right before they saw the second season, so you don't need to reaffirm these kind of things. And then finally, we end with Arya, who is awesome. She's talking with the, the man who's taking the nice watch, um, Yorin, I believe his name is, I could be wrong, but I think it's Yorin. And he talks about how, like, his brother was, how a his family was killed, and how he just kept remembering the guy's name over and over and over so he would never forget. And then when he finally saw the guy, he killed him, and that's how he ended up in the Night's Watch. And this is the beginning of Arya slowly, slowly, slowly going, kind of woohoo. Um, and then you've got men from King's Landing coming to try and find Gendry because he's a bastard and Joffrey's like getting rid of all of them. And so there's a, the slaughter, they kill the Yorin, they kill a bunch of people, they kill one of the little kids because he's like, you want to be carried? <laughs> nope. And Arya uses her brain and he's like, that kid you just killed? That was him. Sucks, right? And so he ends up, she ends up saving Gendry's life and they're, the rest of us in the process and so we're going to see them get moved on. These three episodes have been really good. I, I, I love the show, so I'm biased, but I feel like the only problem I have is that when they break off for sex position, okay, I am not a prude, okay? I have no problem with sex in shows, nudity, none of that stuff. Hell, I want more penis on Game of Thrones. But, I don't understand the point of having scenes with two women having sex with each other and then having dialogue over that, because how are you going to pay attention to those two things at the same time? Like, that doesn't not help the story move on. And Roz, when she gets a whole five minute scene with her talking to Littlefinger, just crying about someone else's baby, I'm like, why? What? Girl, stop. The sex part of it is, is, I don't mind it, and I don't think it should go away because sex is part of Game of Thrones, but just like, it just will be there and nothing will be added to it. It's just gratuitous to a degree where it just takes away from the entire storyline and there, nothing is added to it. Like, especially if you look at the first, in the first season, even then you had sex, it didn't even have to be that kind of way. Like, how Danny and Drogo were. Like, that's not how it was in the book. So why did you have to make all this, oh yeah, he's raping her every night and she's crying. Why, what? Why did you have to do it like that when it wasn't that way to begin with? It just seems very awkward, especially in a show where it's so plot driven and so much going on. You only have ten episodes. Why do you have five minutes dedicated to a scene where two girls are having sex over Littlefinger talking about his life? Or just... It doesn't make any sense. Like, if you're going to have gratuitous nudity, nudity or sex, let it add to something. Like the scene where Viserys is having sex with one of Danny's handmaidens in the last season. That, it was, there was sex, it was hot, you had fan service, but you also got story. You got to see Viserys' character, and it was something interesting. Even the part where, you know, had Danny and the handmaiden teaching her to be, like, ride him. That also was good because it built up character. It told a story. It was interesting. This is not interesting. It's just two girls going at it with nothing going on. I mean, it's hot, yeah, but that's all it is. And you only have ten episodes. You only have so much plot. And you have so many characters you have to develop and dive into. You don't have time for this. Season one, you had one focus, one main focus, and that was Ned. And you could separate it through a few things, but it was all connected to one storyline. Here you have five different storylines going on at once. You do not have time to waste on titties. That is all.